Hi, friends, and welcome to 15241 Today Talk. And today, Jim Render and I are truly honored to have basketball great Susie McConnell with us. Great player, high school, college, pros, Olympian, coach at uh, all those levels. Jim, get us started. Well, Susie, I've been personally uh, a fan of yours for a long time. For a, a small young lady to ascend to the Olympic level, to me, is uh, truly amazing. So could you tell me about when you started practicing basketball at a young age and and how that development happened? Well, when you're a little kid, you don't think about where a sport will take you or the opportunities that you will ever have. I got interested in playing basketball because of my two older brothers. And I was, so to speak, a little tomboy when I was younger. Um, Followed my brothers everywhere, played the sports that they played, and actually we didn't even have a girls basketball team when I started playing at the small Catholic school, Our Lady of Loretto in Brookline. So uh, the coach had asked me to play on the boys team. So for two years I played on a boys basketball team, and then we started a girls program. So I would just um, really credit my family. I grew up one of eight kids, so when you're in a family like that, competition comes every day in everything that you do and sports was a big part of our family. So I, I played volleyball, I played basketball, I played softball. I did cr like track and cross country, and anything gymnastics, anything when you were a little kid, you tried everything, but fell in love with the game of basketball. And that became my focus and you know, through grade school into high school and then obviously wanted to play that in college, had the opportunity to go to Penn State, play there. And then you never knew. Um, you know, wh where it would take you. And, you know, when you watch the Olympics on TV and you see those players, you know, winning a gold medal and standing on that platform, I mean, there's no greater feeling than representing your country. And that became a dream of mine once I was in college and had seen that opportunity. Um, the 1984 Olympics is when, you know, I started to realize that I would love to be able to do that. That would be a dream come true for me. So it's, you know, all through college, and you think about that, and, and you try to do what it takes to put yourself in a position to be um, able to play in the Olympics someday. What do you think you did as a, as a young person to start separating yourself from thousands of other girls? Well, things are different now than they were back then, but, you know, I, I went to, as I said, a small Catholic school, and we wore a uniform to school. But, you know, I lived two minutes from the school, so we came home for lunch every day. I would come home, I would eat lunch, and I would be out in the backyard shooting basketball in my uniform. I would come home from school, I would change, I would, I would, we would go outside and play, and I was, we had a hoop in our backyard. So, like, it, we had a lot of kids in our neighborhood, so we were always playing sports. And that, that was something I always, I felt like I always had a ball in my hand. Um, not necessarily doing the training and hiring people to work me out um, because I had so many people that I could rely on and depend on um, throughout my career that, that we, I was training. Um, but I played AAU basketball, had the opportunity to do that. Um, but I, I just credit all of my teammates. I, I credit the coaches that I've played for. I've, I credit my, my family, as I said, for their support, their encouragement people that helped me um, get to where I, wa I, I did because I never would have gotten there by myself. I played a team sport, so I depended on a lot of people for my success throughout my career. Um, do you, does the McConnell kids still play horse uh, occasionally at a family picnic? Or? <laughs> I, I think now that um, all of us are grown, and now that our kids have played sports, you know, it's more drawing up X's and O's and talking basketball and schemes and different things that we have done um, when we've gotten to family functions. It's more about, you know, what do you do in this situation? What have you done here? We talk about players. We talk about teams. So it, 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 it has gotten away from the actual physical game and more <laughs> talking about it. I think you ought to go outside and play a little bit. <laughs> How many years did you start at uh, Penn State? All four years. All four years. Mm -hmm. Holy cow. That's something, Lanny. And, um, and then tell, tell us a little bit about the two Olympic uh, experiences. Playing um, in the Olympics, obviously, is the ultimate dream come true. And I was just finishing college 
when it was the 1988 Olympics and training and trying out for that team was so stressful because back then you actually went to the Colorado Springs, we went to the Olympic Training Center, we were trying out for the Olympics and um, we, uh, it started with 53 players and after the first tryout over a four or five day period, they cut it down to 21 and then another tryout got cut to 18 and then throughout it, the Olympic team we started in April wasn't even selected until August 18th and it was cut down to the 12 players three alternates and so that summer you know you're just focused on training and in the tryouts and trying to you know do everything you can to make make the team and I'll never forget it when Kay Yao who was our Olympic coach we were training in Myrtle Beach South Carolina and she had individual meetings with all of the players. And when I sat down in the chair, I was so nervous. I was so anxious. I, I just wanted to know. At that point, you just it, you want to know. And the Olympics were in September. So, you know, I sit down and she tells me that I made the team. And I just remember the emotion that I had um, of being told that I was going to be one of 12 players to represent our country. And, and then to play in the Olympics and play with the best players in the world, you know, you're playing with the top players, and then you're playing against the greatest players in, in the world, and um, to win a gold medal, and to be in the Olympic Village, and to be around all of those great athletes. Um, something that was very special being a part of the Olympics was the opening ceremonies, because it is the very first time that every athlete in your congregation is together, and they have you in a holding field another arena stadium and everyone's together and you're getting pictures taken with all of these athletes and you're meeting them and um, it, it truly was amazing and then you're all dressed in your opening ceremonies outfits and then you walk into that stadium as an entire group and you hear that stadium erupt I mean it, it's unbelievable it's 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 just something you wish people could experience that along with you know winning a gold medal in the Olympics because it, it's just amazing but then to, to, to play in it and, and remember winning that gold medal feeling when that buzzer sounded and storming the court and winning that gold medal was, um, was amazing. Who were some of the other American athletes that represented our country when you, um, when you On the Olympics, um, Therese Edwards. Uh, she's a five-time Olympian, one of the most decorated, right. um, unbelievable players. Uh, Cynthia Cooper, um, Ann Donovan, who unfortunately has passed away. Um, uh, Teresa Weatherspoon, Cami Etheridge. Um, what about some of the male track athletes or basketball? Carl Lewis. Um, oh, it was Chrissy Everett Lloyd. I mean, I'm just trying to think of, of the pictures that I had. Um, uh, Jackie Joyner Kersey. I mean, it was all of those athletes that, you know, from the 88 Olympics. And then in the 92 Olympics in Barcelona, Spain, that was the first year of the Dream Team. So that was a completely different Olympics with, um, you know, training and, and flying on a chartered plane with the men to the Olympics. And um, it, it was just, uh, that was completely different. Unfortunately, we won the bronze medal um, in that Olympics, but, but still I wouldn't take away from having the experience of being in the Olympics and, and representing our country. Well, I, I bring this up and I'm glad you expounded on it because we in the South Hills, uh, uh, to me, you, you've done marvelous things as an athlete. And uh, to, to represent your country as one of 12 women, I mean, that's, that's super. And I just think it's great. Thank you. 88 was where? Seoul, Korea. Seoul, Korea. And then 90, that was the year that they won the gold. We won the gold, And then yes. 92, you won the, you won the bronze. Correct. Um, when when you when you talk to other people about about basketball, what is it about the game that you think is so significant? You know, I just think <clears throat> growing up and having played the game, um, the the love I had have I still do, um, even though I'm not necessarily in the game right now. Um, I think the love you have for a sport, um, all the hard work. Uh, the determination, the, the teamwork, and you learn so many lessons um, about you, and you learn things about yourself, but you learn lessons about life, what it takes to be successful, um, how, how you can challenge yourself, the things that you can accomplish when you put your mind to it, um, how hard you have to work to make dreams come true, um, believing in yourself, gaining confidence in, in things that you do. 
Um, but I mean, just sports teach you so many lessons, valuable lessons in life, not just in, in the sport that you are playing. Um, but I've loved basketball and, and I never imagined the things that I would have been able to do. I mean, I've seen the world, um, you know, playing at, at high levels, playing at the professional level, the people that you meet, the friends that you have, um, the, the coaches that you play for. Uh, it, it, I look back at my career and I've had time now to reflect on that and the opportunities that I have had, I'm so thankful for. And, you know, I never thought a little girl from Pittsburgh, you know, just growing up playing it because I enjoyed playing it in my backyard, never imagined the opportunities that I would have had over my career. You and Pete have four children, right? We do. Um, what are their names and ages and are they, um, are they basketball people? Well, they've all played. Um, actually, they went to Upper St. Clair High School, and um, and then my son actually uh, went to Duquesne University when I was coaching there. Um, he uh, is a pharmacist. He's 28. Peter uh, lives downtown, has a, has a good job as a pharmacist now, uh, living his you know a very good life, I think. Um, and then I've, we have three daughters: Jordan, who is 25. She graduated from the pharmacy school at Pitt and then um, is now doing a residency at Children's Hospital in Philly um, and wants to be a clinical pharmacist in the hospital. And then my daughter Mandy just graduated from the nursing program um, at Pitt. Uh, she did the accelerated nursing program, so you know, she's studying for the test and um, will have a job uh, waiting for her. And then my youngest daughter, she's 23, and then Madison, who is 22, is in her last semester of the nursing program. Wait a minute, so the McConnells have gone from a basketball family to a medical family now, <laughs> They right? have. I don't know where it has come from, but we have, uh, we'll have two pharmacists and uh, two nurses in our family. Um, why is it that you and Pete decided to raise your family in Upper St. Clair? Uh, it was that um, our kids were very young when we moved to Upper St. Clair, and basically because of the school district. Um, we, you know, growing up in Pittsburgh, and, you know, I grew up in the city. My husband grew up in the city. And once we got married, actually, he was a firefighter for the city of Pittsburgh. So when we were first married, we lived in the city. And then he you know, decided to go back to school. I started coaching high school. He went back to school to get his teaching degree. And then he had become a teacher. And when we started having kids, uh, you know, we started to think about where we wanted to live, where we wanted to raise our, our children. And you know, we just thought Upper St. Clair being in the South Hills is where we wanted to be and decided on Upper St. Clair, and I, I, I've loved it. I mean, I, I love the education, I love the community. Um, even, um, I, we lived in Upper St. Clair when our kids were young. Then I moved to Minnesota to coach with the Minnesota Lynx. And when we moved back three years later, we chose to come back to Upper St. Clair just because we've loved the area. We've made some good friends, it's good people, but um, very happy with everything uh, it has to offer, and our, our, we feel like our kids have were well prepared once they left Upper St. Clair High School through this school system, and then going to college, and and obviously are doing very well. We think. What's Peter doing? He's a pharmacist. Um, he has a, a job in in Monroeville working for a specialty pharmacy. So he went from firefighter to teacher. Oh, my husband. I'm oh, sorry. I apologize. I'm sorry. I'm, sorry. I'm sorry. You mentioned. Um, my uh, my husband is a teacher. He's a the middle school at Boyce Middle School, so he's a teacher. What does he teach at Boyce? Uh, health and phys ed. Okay. Um, I'm famous for my four by six cards. <laughs> Very the, famous. The, yeah, the, this, is, this is phenomenal. The McConnells have won 19 WPIAL titles. You've won six. Two as a player, Seat and LaSalle. Four as a coach at Oakland Catholic, right? Right. right okay. I, I didn't know this. Tim has won seven. Six as a boys coach at Chartiers Valley. And one as a girls coach. Kathy has won two, both as a player. TJ and Maddie have won each, one, one, one WPI outside of each. Right. Uh, those are Tim's sons. Uh, and Megan's won two at 19. That's a, that's a phenomenal record. That's, that's really. You didn't know that? You didn't I, I know did it was not, 19? I did not know that. That's, uh, Unmatched. Nobody's going to beat that record. <laughs> uh, we just have a big family, and and obviously, you know, we've made the progression from being players to coaching. Um, I never thought I would coach. I really didn't. When really? I really, that's mm -hmm. interesting. I uh, my degree was in elementary education, and um, never really thought I would ever get into coaching. But um, after I just I just got married, I was pregnant with my son, and um, you remember Fran Mannion, 
he was the athletic director. At, it was Bishop Boyle, and then he was at, and then it was Oakland Catholic. Um, he reached out to me, and to see if I would be interested in coaching high school. And I almost said no, um, just because I was pregnant with my with my son. And um, best decision I made. I coached high school for 13 years, and I felt like it was my way of getting back into the game and staying involved and giving back to the players and hopefully helping them have some of the experiences that I was fortunate enough to have um, in the game of basketball and and I absolutely loved coaching high school. How different is it coaching high school as opposed to college as opposed to the pros? You know the game to me is the same you know you're teaching a different level obviously you know when you when you coach high school the kids are younger they're at a different age and you know where they're aspiring to be as far as wanting to go play in college and um, and the training that goes into that and helping prepare them for college and then you have the college players that some are there just because they'll play in college and some want to be professionals um, and then coaching of professionals is very different because they're already set in their ways. You're, you're not changing their lives. You're just, it, it's more of a business when you're coaching in the WNBA. But to be able to coach the best of the best, it, it's unbelievable. I mean, it's, you know, you, you just, you, they have the commitment, they have the drive, they have des, the desire um, to be great. What, what's the toughest part of coaching a professional athlete? I think blending all of the personalities because they're coming from college and they all come from their universities and colleges that they've played at and they were the best player on their team. And so now they're going to become a professional and now you have to get all of these players that have played 38 to 40 minutes a game throughout their entire career. Now they have, some of them have to come off the bench. Some of them aren't going to play a lot of minutes. And, you know, it's just getting them to believe in you as a coach and trust in your system and, and get them to play together um, as professionals. And um, I had the opportunity, you know, I, I coached at the professional level for um, four seasons and then um, has, have coached for USA Basketball. And it, it's, it, it's unbelievable. I mean, it really is. I, I've, I've loved that level. I've, be, I've loved being able to coach that level of talent um, and getting them to be successful. Um, but college, the, you know, it, it's a completely different world because of recruiting. You know, you have to have players to win. There's no doubt about it. And the recruiting aspect of it is the biggest challenge. It's tough, the recruiting. I, I did a little of that when I was a graduate assistant at West Virginia. And uh, I, I think you're absolutely right. You know, it's you have to be much more than a, uh, an X and O coach. And you do so. for sure. <laughs> let, let me um, let me ask you both to respond to this. I read a quote the other day, referring to a, a to a coach, and it was a pro coach, as I recall. The quote was, "Players don't care what you know unless they know you care." Your reaction to that? Well, I think there's a lot of truth in that. Uh, uh, players, you know especially at the level I've coached, you know, uh, uh, they're looking for a lot of things and uh, they don't want you, uh, their sm players are smarter than you, than you think and they don't want you trying to uh, say what you know and what you did. They, they want to know you care about them as people. And um, I, I don't know if Susie agrees, but uh, uh, I, I, I think there's a lot of truth in that statement that they have to know you care about them first. And that's caring about the good players as well as the people, the players, the, the student athlete that doesn't play very much. Absolutely. I, I mean, I totally agree with, with that statement. I know that players want to have a relationship with their coach. They just don't want to be coached on the floor. I mean, they outside of the game, whatever sport it is, players do want to have a relationship with the coach and um, you know I think as a coach you try to treat your best player as well as you treat your, the player that is coming off the bench because every player is valuable even the players that don't get on the field or on the court you know they make your players better in practice they have a value they, they have value on your team and they are a part of it I think you're as strong as your weakest link 
as a team. So, you know, you try to build team chemistry as a coach. Um, you, you try to build it in so many ways. You build it on the court. You build it off the court, trying to do team bonding things. So every, every player on your team has value. Um, and I think as a coach, you try to relay that. And, and I know that players want to know that you do care about them. You don't have any grandchildren right now, right? I do not. Okay. Looking forward to it, though. Okay. <laughs> the, so the next logical question in my mind is, wouldn't it be a thrill for you someday to coach one of your grandchildren? I, I hope I'm still able to walk when I have grandkids. <laughs> no. um, I, I, I mean, I've coached my kids um, at different levels uh, when they were younger. And actually, uh, two of my daughters played for me in college for a year and um, two each. But, um, I mean, I've coached my kids. They, you know, they, I think they think I'm harder on them. So, you know, having a grandchild, uh, I'd love to see my grandchildren play the game of basketball or um, any sport, but my daughters date a baseball player and a hockey player. So I have no idea if, uh, and one is played soccer and is a musician. So, you know, I don't know, but my son would probably try to steer his children towards basketball. The, the ability to be good in athletics, is it DNA or is it DNA and the commitment you make and the hard work you put into honing your skills? I, I think it's a little of both. I think you know, from a young age, I think you can see when children have athletic talent. Um, and I think, you know, different kids find their niche. But, you know, if you become an athlete, um, you have to have the drive. Um, you know, you can't force a person to have it. Um, you can encourage it, you can guide it, but I don't think that you can force somebody to have that commitment. I mean, they have to have a, a, a drive within them to be able to excel. Um, but I, I think you, you can get more out of great athletes, but I, don't, I, I think it has to be individuals. Let me go back to your career once again. You're in the Women's Basketball Hall of Fame. Do you get together? Do, are there reunions, or do you go back? And as, is there some kind of formal get together every year? Or? Uh, well, it's in. It's usually in June is when the Women's Basketball Hall of Fame induction ceremony is every year. So um, I'm invited back every year. I just haven't had the opportunity to go back. Where is that? Uh, it's in Knoxville, Tennessee. Knoxville, Tennessee. Yeah, I mean it, it's. I mean it's an unbelievable venue. I mean it's it's beautiful. It's absolutely beautiful. They've done a great job with uh, the Hall of Fame, uh, the actual building, and then the ceremony. Um, it is amazing. The whole weekend is just fabulous. They just, they, they treat you like queens. You need to go back. I know, I know. Um, I, I often think, now that I've been announcing high school sports, I often think back to when I was in high school in the 60s and there didn't seem to be much attention paid to girls sports or women's sports even. Isn't it great now that that, that there's that opportunity because we know how important sports is to the development of young people and that, that women are so actively involved in athletics. Well, I love being able to turn on the TV, uh, you know, throughout the basketball season and now that these conferences have their own networks and you can find a game, you can some sort of basketball game on any of the networks now. Um, ESPN, they have the, the games of the week and um, you know, I can stay involved in the game just by watching it on TV. But uh, the exposure that and the notoriety that these players are getting now is it, tremendous. Um, they've worked very, very hard to get to this point and um, the coverage, and, and hopefully it continues because now these little girls have players to look up to and to emulate and have as role models. And uh, I, I think it's fantastic because, you know, when I, w I was younger, I didn't have that. My role models were my two older brothers because that's what I saw firsthand. Or, you know, it was John Stockton. I was my favorite point guard and loved watching him play. But I didn't have female role models that I could turn on a TV and, and watch and, and really follow their careers um, and say, I want to be like her. And I think these young girls now have that opportunity. Have you thought about uh, trying to get into broadcasting or color commentary work at I, I did it for one year for the Big Ten um, back in, I think it was 2006. Um, it's not my forte. Um, I, I don't know that, that I would do it. I, it's not something that I was ever very comfortable. 
I didn't go to school for that. It's I, I don't like having a microphone in front of me, believe it or not. It's kind of like me sitting here uh, with this professional uh, right. broadcast person. <laughs> a little intimidating. Trying to stumble yeah, my right. way through yeah. of asking a good question. What was it about broadcasting you didn't like or you didn't feel comfortable in your fort? Um, I was comfortable talking about the game because, you know, watching a game, I, I dissect it all the time, like what a team is running, what, you know, what defense they're in. So when I, I watched a lot of film, I would, you know, so when I watch a game, I, I don't know that I ever watch it just as a true fan. I'm always, I was always learning and trying to pick up things, whether it was an out-of-bounds play or, you know, what I would rewind and I would, you know, take notes and, 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 and really watch what people were doing and stealing from, you know, great coaches. But, um, I don't know. It was just, it was a different, it was a different life. I mean, just trying to, um, I, I wouldn't mind it. I, I couldn't do certain things. I wouldn't want to be in the studio, but I could sit and talk about the game and do the, the color commentating. I, I did enjoy it. And I, you know, cause you meet with the coaches and you talk about their strategies and the game plan and uh, what they need to do. And then, you know, you're watching the game. And so you got a little bit behind the scenes, prior to the bro actual game that you're broadcasting. Um, and I only did it once a week, so, you know, throughout the season for the Big Ten. So it, it was it was a good experience. I did enjoy it. Uh, the, 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 the game now, and we've touched on this a little bit, but is the game dramatically different than it was 30 years ago? Um, it's different, but I, I, I wouldn't say dramatically. I think you're, you know, you're looking at um, a different style. A lot of people have gone um, to more like an open pose, like the, the style of like up tempo, um, you know, not true too true post. A lot of people might go like four guards, but it's a bigger guard. Um, I, I just I just think when you watch the game, it, it's a little different. There's a lot more. Uh, pick and rolls, two-man game, um, isolations, that, that sort of thing, I think, in the women's game as, as you watch the game advance. Um, and I think you're, you're watching so many more great players because people are, if you've noticed in, when players are at a young age, they're forced to choose a single sport because everything has become year-round. You know, you have club and you have AAU and you have all these different things that um, kids are torn in, in different positions, different uh, situations where they can't play club soccer. There's club soccer and volleyball. It overlaps with basketball. And I think as they get to middle school, high school, they're becoming single sport athletes, which is making, you know, players train more. You're looking at parents who are paying all this money for teaching lessons and workouts and train and you know trade trainers as far as weightlifting and I think they see the writing on the wall their kids had the opportunity to get a scholarship and maybe play at a high level and they're becoming more single sport focused so I think you're you're also seeing some great players because of this the focus although sometimes it's unfortunate because then you have injuries because of the overuse of the training of just that one sport, but um, I think you're seeing a lot of great players because of their becoming single sport athletes. Do you watch your uh, nephew play Absolutely. pro basketball? He's now with Indianapolis. Indiana Pacers. Indiana Pacers. Yep. Pacers. yep. We're so happy for him. He has had an amazing career, and you talk about someone defying the odds um, of being told, you know, you're too slow, you're too short, you're not good enough. Um, he just, you know, when he was an undrafted rookie and had the opportunity to sign with the team, he chose Philadelphia. And um, every time there was an opportunity, players were injured. Um, and any time he, he, he stayed in shape, he stayed focused, he stayed ready. And he just took advantage of every opportunity he had gotten when he got, had, had, had the opportunity to play. And um, we've loved watching him play and are so proud of him. I, I enjoy watching him play. Uh... In fact, I saw him play. It may have been it may have been Christmas Day. I can't remember, but they they were in Madison Square Garden. Philly was in Madison Square okay. Garden. So I texted Timbo and say said I'm watching your son. <laughs> well, anyhow, he thought I was at Madison Square oh, Garden, at the game. Uh, but I was enjoying it on television. Yeah, we have the NBA package so that we can watch his games. He's on sure. the road. Yeah. Susie McConnell, you're a great player. 
great coach, great person. And and thanks very much, Jim, and I really appreciate you. Thank being you. With us today. Thank you. I've always enjoyed listening to you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for having me. One five two four one uh, town talk or today talk. Is that what it is, Linda? Today talk, right? And again, thanks to Linda Dunzinski, our coordinating producer, Glenn Ward, our director and producer. And thank you folks for joining us for our program today.